Ice, one of the main elements of the Legend of Spyro. Cold and beautiful. It's an element that serves both defensive and offensive roles, as well as some never even portrayed in the games. Greetings historians, welcome to Lore of the Dragon. Ice is an interesting element. Its story, both inside and outside of the games, tell a rather different tale than, let's say, fire or even earth. What is most known is that it contains the ability to shoot arches of ice, freezing enemies, and even at times bury them within snowballs to be used against one's foes. But the history of the element itself takes a very different turn, and ties into an element not even seen in The Legend of Spyro. Water. It's no surprise to many that ice and water share a connection. Ice is simply the solid state of water, but even as an element the two are tied. In notes from the lead concept artist Jared Pawn on DeviantArt, it said that to harness the power of ice, one must understand the nature of water. Now, this and the following statement are a bit contradictory to what we see in the games themselves, as at least Spyro, from what we can tell, did not have to know any innate knowledge or have an understanding of water to use ice. In fact, his ability to use ice was gained again, like fire, through a sort of trauma, one triggered by the Atlawa, Kane, who was about to be carried off a floating island by a river. Perhaps this is because he's the purple dragon, perhaps this is because there are multiple ways to learn ice, but let's just keep this in mind going forward. This supposed understanding of water allows the ice dragons to use ice supposedly, and masters of the elements to achieve great things like slowing down an army or even as it's said, provide drinking water to a thirsty village. This is well, never featured in the games, but it opens us to ice's seemingly inherent ability to be used as a survival tool as well as an offensive element. Through the aforementioned understanding of water, one can manipulate the moisture in the air around them, as water often floats around in the air, or even, in the most dire of circumstances, use the water from one's own body. This presents perhaps a very diverse set of abilities, far too numerous to account for this talk. But what is said is something akin to armor made of ice, or spikes when on the offensive. Naturally, this connection between that of the water dragons and the ice dragons, although the matter if they're canon or not remains to be seen, assuming they are, there are mentions of the relations between ice dragons and water dragons, or at least their personalities on a macro level. Ice dragons are said by Jared Pollan to be more aloof and elitist when dealing with their more affable and flexible water cousins. From a cultural standpoint, this is no doubt tied to the elements and how each dragon presents themselves through their cultures. And this can be somewhat seen in Cyril, the Ice Guardian, even though he isn't talking to any water dragons. He seems very pompous and, like this says, elitist, to put it bluntly. I imagine cultural scenarios might be fun to come up with between these two distinct groups, and although they perhaps could have frustrated each other at times, they still were tied together by the nature of their elements. But of course, I can't not mention the fact of trivia that has a lot of people curious, or one that people find often funny when actually put in context as to who Cyril is. Supposedly, at one point in the development of The Legend of Spyro, Ciro was supposed to be a female water dragon and still a guardian. This, however, did not happen, and we obviously got a male ice dragon instead. I honestly think it would have been a bit interesting to see a female guardian, because the rest of them are all male, but is what it is. Now, moving on to the abilities themselves, they include a great many abilities, such as the one seen in Dawn of the Dragon, which include ice spikes and snowstorms and their variants. But I want to focus on the upgraded forms of these specifically. Ice Stream, Ice Shard, Polar Bomb, and of course the most powerful ability of any element, the Fury. There are four names mentioned, Bisthalon, Hydrax, Perisher, and Favir. Many of the names I can't really derive anything from? Bisthalon's Hydrothermic Ice Stream, Favor's Cryogenic Polar Bomb, 
and Hydrax's Ice Shards of Arctic Hail don't tell much of a story. But like the Fire Fury, the name of the Ice Fury tells of someone called Punisher and his unrelenting blizzard. This elemental phenomenon, a blizzard, could have been perhaps an exaggeration for the Fury and its appearance. Perhaps it could have been so powerful that an unending blizzard was really the only way to describe it. But I am interested in knowing why they choose the word unending. But honestly, I'll leave that up to you guys to speculate. But as always, a big thank you to my Patreons, Abyssa Blue, Jabby, Ozzy, Shaggy, Kiyasu Shin, and Lacko312. I'll see you all the next time we talk. Stay safe, historians.